Welcome to lecture 6 on covariate shift. So let's have a look at what covariate shift actually means. So it basically deals with issues where training and test distribution are not quite the same. Now there are actually many reasons why that could be the case. <clears throat> For instance, it could be that we train on an empirical data set and then we want to afterwards test on the proper distribution or we could have a situation, you know, that's proper covariate shift, where, you know, the distribution over the covariates, namely x's, is different between training and test set. You could also have adversarial data, or you could have outright label shift. So in this class, we're going to cover the first three of these aspects, and we'll defer the label shift to lecture seven and onwards. So let's dive right in. And let's actually briefly recap what generalization performance is all about. So let's say I want to train on some cats and dogs, right? Because, you know, they look cute. And I could go and find some classifier, maybe like so. And that nicely separates cats from dogs. So as you would have guessed it, well, maybe things aren't quite so easy because maybe, you know, I forgot this nice little Doberman there and you can easily see that by just changing our decision boundary we could easily incorporate this. Okay, But then you know bad luck strikes again and we see a black cat and the black cat just happens to be on the wrong side of the boundary and so we might have to adjust our classifier further so maybe our new classifier now happens to look something like this. So what I'm getting at is that as we observe more data, obviously our decision boundary in this case becomes increasingly refined and we'll be able to perform any classification tasks more accurately. Furthermore, if this black cat happened to be in the test set, right, and maybe this Doberman also happened to be in the test set, then, well, those two would have probably been misclassified because remember our initial classifier looked something like this, right? And we have gotten both the cat and the dog wrong. Now, of course you might say, well, this is a terribly contrived example. Alex, nobody's as stupid as putting, you know, cats and dogs into a two-dimensional feature space. Well, actually this happens for, you know, more meaningful problems too. So what happens is that in both the, you know, 65, 56 and the 20 layer network, the training and test error are quite different. So if we, for instance, look at the training error here, right, it's something around that. And this is the gap between training and test error. Now you might say, well, maybe it's just an issue of capacity and a better network would have actually done better. Well, actually it doesn't, but Basically, in this case here, the 56 layers network performs worse on the test set too than on the train set. So this is taken straight from the 2015 paper on the ResNet, just because, you know, I want to make sure we can see a real world example rather than just a contrived one. Now, of course, that's not the only case where this happens. For instance, you could have a situation where you Maybe you want to tell Alexa to turn off the coffee machine, but because you have a bad day, you just bark on it. Alexa, coffee machine off, right? It's not even proper English. And okay, by now, I know that Alexa will work reasonably well for that, but it's non-trivial to get this right on both training and tested. So you might ask yourself, you know, why is that the case? Well, at the heart of it, what happens is that we have some distribution P of X and Y, and the data set is drawn from P of X and Y, and we then go and minimize the empirical risk, maybe plus some capacity control on that data set. So I have my data set of X, I, and Y, I terms, right? And I going from one to N or actually here in this slide it's M. And then what I can do is I plug this data in here. 
So I have some function and some, you know, true value. So this is basically my prediction. It's the truth. And I'm putting that in quotes because it's not necessarily the truth. It's just the Y that you sampled from it. So it could, for instance, be a noisy case, but be it as it may, I go and minimize this. Now at test time, what matters is actually the expected risk. So in other words, here I have some X and Y pairs drawn from the true distribution. And then I have this loss F of X and W and Y. Now you might say, well, actually, what about if we are given the test data explicitly? Well, then you actually have a transduction setting. And in that case, the math is a little bit more interesting, but the issue is similar. So let's put that a little bit more concretely. So this is our fancy data distribution. It's, you know, some mixture of Gaussians, whatever it may be. And I go and draw samples from it. And because I have, you know, more data drawn here, so I'll end up drawing more samples from it. Whereas here, where there's very little data, where the density is low, well, basically in that region, I'm less likely to observe much data. And as luck would have it, there's only exactly one sample, namely this one here. So, well, the trouble is we don't really have the benefit of knowing what the distribution was. The only thing we're given is the empirical sample, right? So remember, this is what the data look, what the density looked like. This is what we see. And yeah, it might not be a terribly bad idea to model it like so. And that kind of sort of gets it all right. But if you compare it to what we had there, well, is only, you know, some hack. So how would you go and fix this? Well, one way to fix it is you have a separate validation set. So you basically have, you know, some separate data that's not used for training. And I'm going to use that to validate, you know, how accurately things work. This used to be a really big deal once upon a time when data was scarce. By now, when data is plentiful, let's say for instance, you have like the ImageNet data set and you have maybe a million observations. Well, then it's not a big deal if maybe I set aside a thousand or 2000 observations for validation because that's, you know, less than point, you know, less than 1% of, you know, the training data. And so there's this thing called a chain of bound and it's actually a very powerful tool because it says that the deviation between the empirical average let's say on the validation set and the ex expectation that the probability for this deviation to be greater than epsilon is less equal than two minus two e to the minus two m epsilon squared. So why is this good? Well, it's good because e to the minus something here, right? That's you know, fast exponential rate. On the other hand, if you look at this term m epsilon squared, right? So what I want is that this term is large, but it also means therefore that if I increase, you know, epsilon by, if I decrease epsilon by a factor of 10, then I need to increase m by a factor of 100. So it means that fairly coarse guarantees are very cheap to come by, but as soon as I want to get really refined guarantees, it's not so effective. Now, if I apply this, well, what I could do is for instance, I could say, well, you know, epsilon be maybe 0 0.01. And then I might want to require this probability here to be less equal than 0 0.05. And so what I would get is that, you know, log of 0 0.01 is, in that case, greater or equal than 2 times m times epsilon squared and 
yeah, that holds with 99% probability. And if we make this also, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, then well, what we get is that we now have two times M times, you know, divided by 10,000 has to be, you know, has to satisfy this. And so, you know, that gets us a reasonably effective term. And yeah, I apologize. The inequality, of course, is wrong. It's the wrong way around. It has to go this way around. Okay, now, one last thing is that the loss here, in order for the chain of bound to work, has to be in the range between zero and one. If that's not the case, well, then you just go and rescale things. So the reason why you need it is because otherwise I could always make my bound awesome by just, you know, scaling up the loss by a factor of 100. And then, of course, epsilon no longer looks quite so stringent. And so you can already see just as a sanity check in order to avoid a vacuous bound, you need this. Okay, so let's look at some, you know, work through example here. And here we have exactly the minus log delta over 2m. So if I have delta equals 0.05 and epsilon is 10 to the minus two, uh, 2, then we know that I need, you know, 15,000 observations. So that's quite a bit. If, for instance, I only, you know, required epsilon to be, let's say epsilon is 0 0.5, zero three something then i would only need 1500 observations so you can see that you know very quickly as you you know relax epsilon delta can be a lot more relaxed okay so now the other thing that you can do if i have you know this empirical observation i can go and smooth it out right so i could for instance add some noisy data so this is noisy data. And people actually do that. So let's say I want to perform, you know, some object classification and I have some tree. Okay, so that's the stand for tree and I'm probably butchering it a lot. What you could do is you could transform it into, you know, some parts of the tree where now, you know, the poor treetop has been chopped off on its own, right? And most people would say, yeah, that's probably still a tree. And you could go and maybe crop out, you know, some other parts, regions of it, right? And you would still say, well, that's a tree. So that's actually a good thing. But basically what you do is you add noisy variants of the original data in order to ensure that you artificially increase your training set. And with that, you know, you can make up for the fact that you only have empirical observations rather than the true distribution. Okay. So let's just quickly recap the key takeaways from, you know, that issue about empirical averages versus expectations. So training minimizes typically some empirical risk. So it's, you know, the sum one over M I going from one to M of, you know, the loss incurred for observations YI and F of XI. But at test time, what we really want is we want to minimize the expected risk for data drawn from some distribution. And then, you know, you go and, you know, you compute the test error if we have some specific set and you can use validation in order to get more reliable estimates. The last part of warning is that doing really well on the training set means exactly nothing you can get amazing performance on the training set, but unless you actually regularize properly, it's no use. And that's the first part of this course.